Yo friend, welcome back to another episode of Tech Tuesdays. In this video, we're gonna dive into a bulletproof media management system for adventure filmmakers, vloggers, and the client work that you might be working on to help pay <laughs> for the other two things. I have hundreds of terabytes of data, but I've developed a robust workflow for managing all of it. So first, let's just blitz through an overview level of what's going on at each stage in my production process. I back up my cameras daily in the field to get two copies of the media as soon as possible. My laptop has two internal hard drives and I use generic USB 3.0 external drives. I copy the footage from each card to at least two hard drives on import. You can do this manually, but lately I've been using an importing tool called Hedge. I drag the camera cards to one side and then the destinations on the other, and then I label the camera cards which camera they came from. I then open up preferences and add the project name to the automated folder naming structure. The cards are then imported into the multiple locations using a checksum transfer and putting them inside automatically named folder structures. All the data for each project exists within a single project folder. Then when I get back to the studio, I take one of the offload drives and move the data from it to my main GTEC editing RAID. The GTEC houses a total of eight terabytes in RAID zero for the fastest speeds possible. When the project file has made it safely to the editing RAID, another utility I use called Carbon Copy clones the edit RAID automatically to two separate eight terabyte drives within this cheaper USB 3.0 RAID unit. The field offload drive then gets moved to another geographical location for safekeeping. Once the project is complete, it gets archived to a pair of eight terabyte external drives. These drives are plugged in on a monthly basis to spin up and make sure they're in good health. All of the hard drives and RAID units I actively want to access are stored on a shelf within my wildly functional studio desk. You should definitely check out the video of me building it here. For those that just want quick takeaways off the top, let me give you four tips to send you on your way. Import your media into two drives while on location. Second, move this footage when you're ready to edit onto a high speed editing RAID. Third, have an hourly clone of this RAID going to at least two hard drives for double redundancy. And four, when you're done with your project, move it off your edit RAID onto two separate archive drives for safekeeping in the long run. It's especially obvious in adventure filmmaking, but we're often working really, really hard to capture moments that might only happen once. And that means when we capture it, we really wanna keep that data safe. The thing is, losing footage is devastating. And this can happen for multiple reasons. It can happen from hard drive failures. It can happen from accidentally formatting the wrong SD cards or not importing your media at all before you go out on the next shoot. And lots of people sometimes go years without anything bad happening, but it almost always catches up with us. So if you haven't had a painful experience yet, I urge you to heed this advice and try to develop a way to keep your data in multiple locations for that just in case moment where everything goes wrong. The simplest way to have a bomb proof workflow is buy two RAID units of the same size, edit from one, and just use a tool like Carbon Copy Cloner to duplicate constantly to another one. But my system's a touch more complicated from that as we import media in the field, import it to the workstation, and archive it for long-term storage. And that's what we're gonna unpack right now. The most important takeaway here is to have a system to know if your card is full and needs to be imported, or is full and can be formatted and ready to use. For SSDs out of my Shogun Inferno or Red Mags from a RED camera, once it's full, I eject it and put tape over the connection so that way I can't possibly put it back in a camera. That tape stays there till it's imported. For my SD cards, I store them in this Pelican case. And if they're ready to go, the label is outwards. And if they've been filled, then they go backwards out. And if I can see the connections there and it's back out, I know this card needs to be imported, do not format the card. Once the card is properly imported though, and I've got it in two locations, I will then take the SD card and put it back, label out, so it's ready to use. On the camera side, it's important to build up a habit 
of automatically formatting your SD cards or media the second you enter it into the camera. Can't tell you how painful it is to start shooting on an SD card, realizing it's already halfway full and then I've got to re-import it and I don't want to go through and delete things. It's just not a good process. Some other things to note is make sure your naming convention in the camera is set to continuous. This way, at the end of a long project, you don't have 10.001.mov files. It will just continually count up every time you put in a new card. It's also worth noting to double check the date and time in your camera. This can be very helpful later to just check when the media file was created. It's also great to just develop a practice of double checking. Hey, is this card ready to be formatted? Yes. At the end of each day, just make sure every drone, camera, audio recorder is all imported into a folder for that day. Sometimes this isn't possible, so I just run the cards all the way till they're full and import them then, but that's not my ideal way to operate. That's kind of under more extreme circumstances. If you're in the mountains though, and you don't have access to power, you've got to conserve that laptop battery as best as possible. I use tools like this RAV Power battery bank with an AC plug to get some extra life out of my laptop while in the field because I really do enjoy making sure that my media is safe at the end of each day. I've come to love these Kingston SD and micro SD card readers. I put these cables and everything into accessory cases so that way I can keep them managed in my backpack on a shoot. When I actually go to import my media, I make sure I get it to two locations on import. Sometimes you just keep one and you're just accepting the risk that, hey, this media could just fly away into the wind and be gone forever. But trust me, two copies, two copies. <laughs> Each project on my computer gets its own folder. The project folder doesn't really matter to me what the name is. Sometimes I put a date at the front of it, but it's mainly just the project title. Inside of the project folder though, I put a folder called masters because as I import more and more cards and more and more footage, I want a consistent database of all that material that could be consistent across hard drives. So that way if I have multiple copies in different places, I know that what's in the masters folder isn't changing, it's only being added to. So I know the random data on a folder is not just gonna change on me and mess up the linking in a project file. So the masters folder is always the first one. One that usually comes up next if I'm editing in Premiere is an edits folder. That's where you put the product file and the auto saves. If I'm editing in Final Cut Pro 10, I'll just put the library file directly in the root of the product folder. I'll just keep adding folders as they become necessary. I'll create a stills folder, a renders folder, a graphics folder, an intermediates folder. I only add these folders as I have a need for them. So that way I don't get confused of why is there a stills folder in this project with no stills in it? Did I accidentally lose them somewhere? Just helps prevent me from panicking. It just keeps things clean as the project expands. I use an import utility called Hedge to manage the importing of each individual card, but I'll show you how you could do it manually. If you wanna to skip to the part where I just explained Hedge, you can go here. Each camera card gets its own folder, and the folder starts with month, day, then year at the beginning of the folder name, so I can arrange by file name and actually see the proper order of the cameras. After the date, I add which camera it was, which project it's from. Sometimes I add a unique identifier, like what was special about that day or the activities of that day. Then I add the real number by increments. I usually only create these camera folders as I'm actually importing each card. So let's pretend this is a card we're gonna import here. I'd select the contents of it, Command C to copy, go over into the correct folder for it, and then Command V to paste. So this folder structure we just created for the project that gets replicated exactly in the second location and imported there as well. So I created this example project just on my desktop to keep it clean, but this project would actually exist on a RAID. And again, it would be backed up hourly, so I don't even have to think about it. So that'd be fun to kind of poke around and see some other product files that I have over the years. So this is my Slack Life BC web series project folder. It's just at the root level of an editing RAID. Then in here, we've got our edits. Graphics are all in here. Then here's the master's folder. So again, I, I've kind of refined the way that I've been naming and numbering my folders, uh, but my rule is I don't go back and change things. So I'm not gonna just update this now that I started doing it differently. But inside, let's say this August 27th folder, you can see the various cameras from that day of shooting. Here's an actual client project folder. Again, here's just all the masters inside the masters folder. A few key features are missing in just the default copy and paste tools inside of an OS. 
which is why you'll probably never walk onto a Hollywood set and see the DIT just copying with Finder. You'll never see that happen. Because when you just copy and paste within Finder, it's not actually verifying if all the data it's transferring to its location is exactly bit by bit identical to the source material. Now this can be fine for Word documents and whatever, but with super sensitive, massive video files where every bit is super important, you wanna be able to verify if what was on the source is identical in its destination. And that's where import utilities that can do a checksum verification become very helpful. So let's pull open Hedge. So inside a Hedge, again, you just put the sources you want on the left and the destinations on the right. You can have as many sources, go to automatically as many destinations as you want. But the cool part, when you hit Add Transfer, okay, so it's gonna ask if we want to reset the folder increment. We'll dive into folder renaming in a sec. What it's doing here as it transfers each file is it's doing a checksum verification. That means it's applying an algorithm to verify that each file that it's putting into the destination is exactly correct with its source. This is the industry standard way in every media management workflow to just make sure that files are getting to their cor correct locations properly. But the cool part about using a utility like Hedge is that it automatically can do my naming convention for me. It transfers massive files quicker than Finder can. And again, it can do that to multiple destinations, but let's cancel here and let me show you the naming convention that's built in, which I find really helpful over here in folders. You can just build a sequence for how it's gonna auto name your file structure. So I have it again doing the month, day and year. Then I have it add the disk title. Then I manually go over here and add in the project name. So we're gonna add an example project and then it will automatically add my reel and the next increment. And then you can reset it for each project. It will automatically prompt you if you're at real, let's say you're at real six. When I go over here and we add this transfer again, it will start popping up as real six. On the destination side, I'll often go through and select that I'm actually making sure things are ending up in the correct masters folders that I want them to be. But if we show where we're doing these current goofy imports, let's look at this. You can see these are the two imports that we just started. The first one was the Calgary Camera Store Real One, and then now we're currently doing the Real Six over here, and it's just moving all those files in. A nice feature is when the transfer is complete, I can get a push notification on my phone. The reason why I've started to adopt using a utility like Hedge, so I can get those industry standard backup features with checksum, but also just automating the process of renaming and going to multiple destinations to help remove the possibility of human error at each step of the project. I bought it full price about a year ago and I've been loving it, but it's still a bit of an investment for an importing tool. So I reached out to the team at Hedge and see if we could get you a discount code and they got us a discount code. So if you use this affiliate link right here, you can get 10% off Hedge. Once the shoot is over and I've come back to the studio, take one of my offload drives and plug it in to my main edit rig. Out of my multiple RAID units that I purchased over the years, this one continues to be my favorite. The entire time I'm editing and making progress on the project, all of that is constantly being hourly backed up to two separate drives within another RAID unit. Carbon Copy automatically manages these hourly backups for me and notifies me if there's any issues. When the project's done and I no longer need to edit it or access the files actively, I'll move it into the next phase of its life called the archive phase. I archive each project folder to a pair of eight terabyte external drives. External drives are nice because you can attach multiple without a special hard drive reader. And it also allows me to invest in them slowly over time as my operation grows. Again, I use carbon copy to select the A drive as the source, the B drive as the destination, put it on a schedule, and then regularly, either once or twice a month, I'll spin the drives up to make sure they're staying in good health. If I bought a server outright, it'd be a huge investment up front, and I wouldn't be able to store those in different locations if it was all within its own server. And so what I've just done is, as Left Coast grows, just continually to buy eight terabyte drives as I need to archive more media. At this point, I'll upload a high bitrate render file to either Google Drive or Dropbox for safekeeping in the future and also delivery to clients. I have a special system for developing download links for clients and I'll have to make another video explaining that. 
If you're interested, drop a comment down below and let me know. And once it's safely on both archive drives, I can then remove the project file from the editing raid and make space for the next project. Whew, that's it. I hope you're tracking with me from beginning to end, but that's the different life stages of what the data goes through as the project gets worked on. For the stills workflow per project and time lapses, it's a few other layers on top of this with their own special steps. If that's something you want, I can address that in an upcoming video. But for now, thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next video. And remember, life's better when you make stuff. Peace.